All right, hey, before we get started, I wanna say happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. I wanna say, hey mom, I love you. Happy Mother's Day to you. Uh, Karen, thanks for being there for my mom, being there with her. I pray uh, God is blessing you, Mom, today. And for the rest of you mothers today, that's my prayer too, that God would bless you. God would bless you today with just um, an ability to hear his voice, just how good he's been to us. He's so good. So let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, and let's pray. Father God, I, I do thank you for the mothers in our lives. Lord, they've loved us, they've cared for us. Lord, they've been there for us as much as they humanly can. Lord, I know that, um, you know, everybody's just, just a person. Lord, we're never to get our eyes on our moms, on our dads, on our, our uh, wives, our husbands. Lord, we're to, to focus on you. But God, how you've blessed us, how you've blessed us with uh, loving mothers, Lord, and how you've blessed us with loving wives to mother our children. Lord, I'm so thankful for Tina. Lord, I just pray, God, you would um, bless all the moms out there today in our church, all the moms that are watching. And Lord, we also just come before you with uh, this time of worship in your word. Lord, we pray that you would uh, breathe life into the study. Lord, that you would anoint it. And God, that it would go out with power, Lord, that it would affect hearts, that it would encourage hearts, that it would stir hearts to walk closer, more committed to you. Lord, so we give you this time. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11 today. We're going to look at the temptations of Christ. Um, one thing that I love about the Bible is actually how it all ties together. How the Old Testament, it is a picture book of New Testament principles. And, um, you know, the Old Testament is pointing ahead to reveal Christ, to reveal the work of the cross. And the New Testament, it's pointing back at the finished work of the cross and Jesus' substitutionary atonement for us. And in all of it, it's so beautiful. There's no contradictions. You've heard this uh, be said before. 66 books in the Bible, over 40 different authors, and they come from all different walks of life. There are kings, there are um, slaves, there are executives, there are blue collar workers, there are educated men, there are uneducated men. And even though we see this, we don't find any contradictions. It's all one harmonious work. It indicates that it was all done by one author, and that's the Holy Spirit. And if you're looking, you see it very clearly how the Old Testament is fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus said himself, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So, again, I want to... Uh, remind you that um, Matthew, what he's doing here, he's not only connecting the Old Testament prophecies to the New Testament person of Jesus Christ, but also what he's doing is he's showing us how Christ has fulfilled the Old Testament. He's a fulfillment of the Old Testament in every way. In Matthew chapter 3, last week, we looked at the baptism of Jesus and how the Holy Spirit descended upon him uh, in the form of a dove. Well, in Exodus 30, what we see is instructions for the preparations regarding the high priest. And then in Exodus chapter 40, we see Moses, he's carrying out those instructions. And really, what were those instructions? Well, before the high priest could enter into public ministry, he had to be washed. He had to be anointed. And in Matthew 3, that's what we see. Jesus, before he enters into his public ministry, he, he's washed in the waters of baptism. And then the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the dove. And then, again, in the Old Testament, the anointing oil that the high priests were anointed with, it was a picture of the Holy Spirit. And we see that anointing of Jesus as a high priest when the Holy Spirit um, came upon him. Now, in regards to the anointing or the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, in preparation for ministry, that's just what the baptism is all about, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people are a little bit confused about that baptism of the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit into our lives. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit 
when we ask Jesus to come into our hearts and forgive us of our sins. At that very instant when we ask Jesus to be our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes into our life and He seals us. It says, Ephesians 1.13, In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's a separate, often subsequent, sometimes the same time, um, pouring out of the Spirit on a person's life for the purpose of the work of the ministry. The Old Testament high priests, they were called by God. They were washed and they were anointed um, before they entered into public ministry. And that's what we see Jesus fulfilling that Old Testament uh, picture there in, in uh, Matthew chapter 3. And that's what I love about, about the Bible. It makes me more excited in the Bible when I see these connections. It makes me want to dig deeper. It makes me want to get into greater insights about the Bible. You know, I want to be a student of the Word. I hope this is your heart too, that we would be students of the Word, not just casual readers of the Word. So Matthew chapter four, verse one says, then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The first thing that I want us to know uh, or notice here is you can count on it. After times of great spiritual blessing, that's when attack frequently comes. There's great spiritual blessings and then following on the hills of them are great spiritual battles, great testing. And we saw that again last week. Jesus was in the waters of baptism, the cool waters of the Jordan. He's surrounded by people. It was just wonderful. It was beautiful. And now we're about to see Jesus. He's alone in the wilderness. It's hot and it's difficult and he's lonely. Before, last week, we saw Jesus. He hears the voice of the Father saying, hey, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But now in a short time, we're going to see Jesus. He's going to hear the voice of the devil. He's going to have the devil question uh, God's love for him. So often we experience that heavenly high, and then we come to face, face to face with a temptation from hell. And you can count on this. This is this is a, a normal occurrence. There are tremendous battles following great spiritual blessings. So Matthew, he starts out here. He says that Jesus was led up into the uh, led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Paul tells us in Romans eight fourteen that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So I want to ask you. Are you being led by the Spirit? Are you someone who's leadable? I mean, is the Spirit able to guide you uh, through your day? Does the Spirit have freedom to interrupt you in the middle of your day and maybe um, upset your plans at all, your, interrupt your daily schedule? It's one thing that I love about Jesus is He never saw people as an interruption. He always had time for people and and people weren't an interruption to him. They were a ministry opportunity. And I want to be like that. I pray that God that would work that into my heart, that I would be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit, that I would see when he wants me to step out and, and talk to somebody. Being led by the Holy Spirit is actually the most exciting part of being a Christian. You know, sometimes you hear people say, oh man, being a Christian is so boring. Well, if that's your view of things, then you don't know what it's like to be a Christian. You know, I can't tell you, I never imagined that God would use Tina and I and our family in the way he has. For years there in Europe, how he's used us here in the States, and, and now we have a ministry over in South Asia. I mean, it never would have entered into my wildest dreams that that was even possible for someone like me. But people who are willing to step out in faith People who are willing to, to take a step when they feel prompted by the Holy Spirit, those are the people that God wants to use. If you'll be leadable, if you're somebody who it will be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and step out in faith when you feel He's prompting you, then God's going to use you in mighty ways. I just, I just want to do more of it. I want to be used more. You know, 
He wants to reach the city of Truckee. That, make no mistake about it. That's God's heart. He's looking for those people that he can lead through the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish that task. Well, it says that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. And I also want us to know that there are really, in a Christian experience, there are legitimate wilderness experiences, okay? Sometimes, you know, you just feel like you're just so distant from the Lord. And it's of no fault of your own. You just feel like you're distant from the Lord. He's no place to be found. In fact, maybe you feel like you're all alone. But that's never the case. It's never true. He's promised never to leave us and never to forsake us. And that, for me, that's such a beautiful promise that I, that I cling to. When he leads us into these desert experiences, it's because he wants to teach us to walk by faith. It's because he wants us to learn to trust in him. It's because he wants us to look to him and learn to wait upon him. When we find ourselves in those desert experiences, we can rest in the fact that he's going to be faithful because we have experiences with him in our past that we can look back to and see how he's been faithful to us and how he's meant us in difficult experiences in the past. And then we can rest in the fact that he'll always be faithful to us because he never changes. He can never be anything but faithful to us. When we get in those desert experiences, you know, he's teaching us that he can be trusted. He's teaching us to learn to walk with him, to take his hand because he's going to carry us through. And and you know what? He wants us to hear from him. It's going to be okay. I tell you what, oh boy, just, just to hear my Savior tell me at times of great spiritual battle, Gary, it's going to be okay. I'm going to, I'm going to get you through it. It's so powerful in my life. When we find ourselves in those dry wilderness experiences, again, not because of any fault of our own. I mean, those legitimate wilderness experiences, when the Spirit leads us into it, the Lord allowed that because He wants to accomplish a work in us. Well, what kind of work is he doing? Well, in your case, I don't, I don't know. I don't always know in my case, to tell you the truth. But what I do know is Psalm 72, 18. It says, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. What's he doing in your life during those times? I don't know, except I know it's a wonderful thing. God only does wonderful things. And we need to take blessing in that. We need to understand that during those times of that desert experience. We're not alone. He's with us. He's right by our side. He's holding our hand. He's seeking to guide us through those difficult times. So we read that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. And we're told, Matthew tells us the purpose, to be tempted by the devil. Just so you know, What I want you to understand is the Greek word translated tempted, it's actually probably more accurately translated. It's more frequently translated tested. Okay, so uh, Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. All right. Well, why would the spirit lead the Lord into the wilderness to be tempted or tested? Well, I can think of three reasons. First, to expose Satan for who he is. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's an enemy of our soul, and he's an enemy of God. Probably the second reason, there you go, second reason, is to reveal Jesus to us as the victor he is. He defeated the devil. He defeated him for us. We have no power against the devil in and of ourselves. I mean, you know what? Left our own devices facing the devil, I mean... Yeah, it it would be disastrous. We're hopeless in our own strength before him. But praise the Lord for the victory that Jesus had over the devil. Jesus said, in the world, you'll have tribulations. You'll have trials and temptations. But he says, be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. As though, I'm sorry, as through him, because of his victory, it's through him, because of his victory, 
It's because of his love for us that we're now more than conquerors. I mean, that's such a, a precious, beautiful thing to, to understand. It says 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have victory. Why would the Spirit lead uh, Jesus into the wilderness? One, to reveal the devil and reveal him for who he is. Two, to reveal Jesus as the victor. And also three, so that the, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tried and to tempt it. It was to prepare him to be a sympathetic high priest on behalf of us, right? Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 says, therefore in all things, he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is also able to aid those who are tempted. You know, when you're facing trials, when you're facing difficulties, when you're facing temptation, you know what? Jesus understands what you're going through. He sympathizes because he's been there. He knows what it is that you're facing. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore... And therefore means in summation, or it means in light of this fact, okay? It says, because he's been tempted and always like ourselves, it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Because he's been tempted, because he's been tried, he sympathizes with our weaknesses. So in light of that fact, man, it's all the more reason to run to that throne of grace, to obtain help, to get grace and mercy um, in time of need. I mean, I tell you what, what a privilege we have as believers to be able to enter into the throne room of grace at any time. You know, in my heart, it breaks my heart that as believers so often we fail to run in. And we just, I don't know, some people are just like, you know what? I'm just going to tough it out. I'm going to pull myself up by the bootstraps, you know? I mean, uh, when, the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. You know what? That's not what Christianity is all about. <laughs> and I think of that old hymn that says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Are you somebody that runs to the Lord in prayer? Are you somebody that's quick to see your need and, and you just run to him? Because you know when you get to him, everything's going to be okay. You know what? That's the type of people we need to be. My prayer is that we as a people, we would bathe everything in prayer. That we would be constantly in prayer about every detail in a constant attitude of prayer constantly conversing with our father praying without ceasing boy that's that's what i want in my life and my prayer is lord make us that type of per people make us that type of church verse 2 says and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards he he was hungry now, fasting 40 days and 40 nights, we see it uh, frequently in the scriptures. And I like to point out to you, Moses, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Remember when he was on the mountain and he got the, the uh, Ten Commandments? What happened when he fasted 40 days and 40 nights? Boy, you know what? Not only did he receive God's law, just fresh revelation, but you know what? His countenance was altered. It was evident to people that saw him that he was... In the presence of God, his face glowed. He it glowed. He was visibly changed by just spending time with the Lord. Elijah, he also fasted 40 days and 40 nights, you might remember. And he saw God's supernatural, supernatural provision for him. And not only that, you know what? Elijah had that wonderful revelation when God spoke to him in that still, small voice. You might remember that 
David, we saw David in the scripture, he's fasting and he was praying. He was doing it for a loved one. You know what? Maybe you have a child. Maybe you have a, you know, a family member that's not walking with the Lord. Maybe you have a friend that just, you know, is, is out there. You know, what would God do if you just spent time fasting and praying uh, for your family? You know, if you did that and just waited upon the Lord, I think you'd be amazed what you would see happen, right? Daniel fasted and prayed. He confessed sins for the, uh, he confessed the sins of the nation as if they were his own. You know, how different would Truckee be if we started to fast and pray and just confess the sins of this community and ask the Lord to, to just pour out his spirit? How different would this city be if we were willing to do that? Well, Jesus was fasting 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry. He was weak. He was all alone. And again, we saw it last Thursday uh, in our study, Genesis 3. We're going to uh, go over a lot of the same topics here. It's just that, boy, when you're, when you're vulnerable, that's when the devil seeks to attack us. We talked about that Thursday, last Thursday, about how the devil's waiting. He's looking for a vulnerability. He's looking for an open door to exploit. And he's willing to wait. He's not in a hurry. He wants to attack you when you're at the weakest. He's not interested in a fair fight. I mean, he's the kind of guy that's going to hit you when you're down and out, kick you when you're down. He's not interested in a fair fight. And that's what we see here in Matthew 4. The devil attacks Jesus when he's at his weakest point. Now, you do need to know this, okay? Mark and Luke, their gospel, they indicate that it's during the entire 40 days and 40 nights that the uh, devil comes and attacks Jesus. But it would appear here that Matthew, he's setting out for us the three worst attacks. They were reserved till the end, till the end when Jesus was most vulnerable, when he was at his weakest. It was at the end of 40 days. That's what Matthew is recording for us. Verse 3, now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread, right? Okay, there's a couple things we need to notice here. First off, it says, when the tempter came. It's not a question of if the tempter is going to come. He's going to come. It's a question of when he comes. And we need to understand this. It's not a sin to be tempted, right? The devil is going to try to tempt us. He's going to try to trip us up. He's going to try to get us to, to bite so that we fall. The sin occurs when I give place to the temptation, When I spend time thinking it out and and living it through in my mind, that's when sin happens. When the police officer pulls me over and he says, hey, do you know how fast you were traveling? And uh, right before he pulls me over, you know, I mean, I see I'm going 85 in a 55 construction zone. It's not a sin to, to be tempted to lie to him at that time. It's a sin when I say, oh, I'm sorry, officer. Wasn't I traveling the speed limit? No, that's the sin, right? When I give place to the temptation, it's acting upon the temptation. That's the sin. But the devil, he comes to Jesus and he says, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. And again, this isn't something that's very important. We can't be confused on. The devil knows that Jesus is the son of God. He knows that he's God the son. The devil isn't questioning if Jesus is the Son of God. In fact, the word translated if, it can be more accurately translated since. Since you're the Son of God, command these stones become bread. And isn't it interesting that that the devil tells Jesus, command these stones to become bread. The devil knows that there's power in the Word of God. He knows it more much more than we realize it. Flip into your Bibles. Turn over to the Gospel of Mark. We'll take a quick look at a section. Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 23 through 27. 
Mark 1, 23 through 27. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. This isn't the only account of uh, demons crying out they know who Jesus is. It's not the only account where he, he rebuked them and they had to uh, listen and obey to his command. There's power in the word of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. Our weapons in God, what are they? They're faith in God. It's the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. It's the Word of God. It's the sword of the Spirit. And it's the power that we have uh, in Jesus' name. James said, speaking of our power to resist the devil, he says, if we will submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee. He has to. Okay? The devil says, since, and I imagine there's some tone of sarcasm here, talking to Jesus, since you're the son of God, command these stones become bread. Now, God just said earlier, just a few weeks earlier, that he, speaking of Jesus, was his beloved son in whom he was well pleased. And so what we see Satan trying to do here is he's trying to raise doubts about the relationship that Jesus has with the father. What Satan is saying here is either one, hey, God's not really your father. I mean, if he were your father and you were the heir of all things, then why are you suffering the way you are? He might be saying, two, maybe God is not really pleased with you. I mean, if he was pleased with you, he'd take better care of you, don't you think? Or maybe what he's saying is, is three, maybe God is your father, but he's just really a bad father because he doesn't seem to care for you. Now, it could be any one of those, could be a combination of them, but the deal is, is Satan's challenging Jesus here to prove that he truly is the Son of God by using his power to gratify his flesh. And it's the same temptation Satan hurls at us today. Satisfy your flesh. Just do it. Go ahead. I mean, why not? The problem is it's sin when we place physical needs and desires above spiritual needs in God's will for our life. Verse 4, But when he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. <clears throat> We read that Jesus, he answers Satan. How did he answer him? He answers him with the word of the God, with the word of God. I mean, you know, I mean, it's almost comical because we don't see Jesus saying, I bind you, devil. You know, we don't see Jesus saying, in the name of Jesus, I cast you out. Hallelujah. You know, it's not what he does. He, he, he speaks to him the word of God. Right? He doesn't um, face Satan now as God Almighty, but he faces him in his humanity. He doesn't utilize the power that he has as God, but he faces Satan with the same uh, resources that we have available uh, to us as we combat evil. It's the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. What we see Jesus doing here is he quotes Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, verse 3. And I don't know about you, you know, I don't have a lot of uh, verses from Deuteronomy re memorized right now. I don't have them memorized. Um, but, you know, he's going to combat the devil by quoting verses from Deuteronomy three times, right? It shows us that Jesus, in his humanity, he was a student of the Word. He was digging into the Word of God. And we need to be men and women of the Word. 
right? We need to study to show ourselves approved to God, a worker who needs not be ashamed, able to rightfully divide the word of truth. Jeremiah 15, verse 16, he says, your words were found and I ate them. And your word uh, was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Boy, that's what the word needs to be to us. The psalmist, he writes, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. And you know, uh, Psalm 119.11, your word I've hidden in my heart that I would not sin against you. Jesus, he said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Now, if I'm not studying the word, if I'm not taking it in, if I'm not hiding it in my heart, if, if you know, I'm not just, just making it the core of who I am, then it's really hard for the Holy Spirit to um, bring it to remembrance when I'm having a difficult time, when I need it. We need to be men and women of the word. Another thing I want to comment on here before uh, we go on is as important as physical food is to life, what Jesus is saying is that we should never put our physical needs above the spirit. We must never allow physical circumstances to dictate our actions as believer. And unfortunately, this is something that happens all the time in the church. I mean, we had a church there in Germany and, uh, you know, we were reaching out to the American military primarily, to German nationals, of course, and other expats that were in the area. And we were 15, 20 minutes outside of town. And I can't tell you how many times I heard, boy, you know what, we want to come to church, but it's just too far. You know, we'd like to be there. If only you guys were in town, maybe you guys might think about moving to town. I mean, we've been in churches and we've planted churches in Eastern Europe where people would ride a bus or a train for two hours just so that they could get there. I mean, we've been in churches in South Asia. We held a pastor's conference uh, a couple years ago in South Asia where pastors were traveling 40 hours nonstop on a hot, overcrowded train with no sleeping compartment to get to the pastor's conference. And then when they got there, it was 10 pastors in a small room, like a 10 by 10 room, and they slept on the floor. I mean, you know what? I've been in churches where 30, 40 people, they crowd into a, a little 10 by 20 room, and they sit on the floor for hours to hear the word of God. I mean, we're spoiled as Christians, and we can never, we can never allow comfort to master us in such a way that it, it dictates what we will or will not do because that will make us completely ineffective as servants of God in this city and also in the world. Matthew chapter 4 verse 5, then the devil took him up into a holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple. Now Matthew uses this word then repeatedly. And what it indicates to us is that these are a series of events, right? Um, Luke and Mark, uh, sorry, Luke, he records this a little bit differently. He records it uh, for his purposes in whatever order he's, he's using. But Matthew is telling us that these are things, they happened in a sequence. He's given us this order. So he's there, he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple. How high is this temple? Well, uh, I don't really know, to tell you the truth. I mean, you read some guys, they say that it's um, 500 feet above the, uh, val the Kidron Valley. Other people say it's 200 feet above the ground. I don't really know how high it is. I would be lying if I told you it, I did. But um, I do know this. Yesterday, I was sitting in my desk, and uh, my office is on the third floor, and I was looking out the window, and I was thinking, boy, it would be so great to hang a bird feeder right there. You know, and I was thinking about it in my mind, and uh, I could see myself hanging out the window to try to attach this bird feeder to the eave of the roof and falling three floors to my death. Okay, so how high is this pinnacle? I don't know, but it's high enough, I'm sure, that it would cause serious damage, right? 
Verse 6, he says, And the devil says to Jesus, If, or since, again, if you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Satan is tempting Jesus here by saying, Hey, you believe the word of God? You want to live your life by the word of God? Okay, prove it. You know what? Here's the opportunity that, that proves. Throw yourself off, man. Make a spectacle, right? What Satan does is he quotes uh, uh, Psalm 91, 11, and 12, but he, he uh, misquotes it. And this is a lesson for us. Never think that the devil can't quote scripture too. Guess what? The guy's a student of the Bible also, right? But because he's a liar, because he's a deceiver, because he's a tempter, he twists the word of God. He perverts the word of God. He not only twists it and perverts it, but he misquotes it and he misapplies it. That's why we need to be students of the word. He conveniently leaves out a very important phrase as he quotes these verses to Jesus. Psalm 91, 11 and 12 says, For he shall give his angels charge over you, and this is what he leaves out, to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. God's, God keeps his promises. He makes promises in his words to us, and he keeps them, period. End of story. But if you're sinning or you're doing something stupid, all bets are off. I mean, there's consequences to our actions. I mean, if I was stupid enough to, you know, hang out that window and attach that bird feeder, uh, you know what? I might have gotten away with it by the grace of God. Praise the Lord, maybe. But you know what? There's no promise that he's going to protect me when I'm doing something stupid, right? He won't allow um, bad things to destroy our lives. But if I'm doing something stupid, he'll allow bad things to enter my life. Like if I break my neck, he'll use that for my glory, right? He's going to use it for my good. You know, I'll never try to hang a bird feeder out that window if I fall and break my neck. I mean, I've learned my lesson, right? That's a good thing. Now, of course, I'm just kind of lightly kidding around. But this is, this is true. People put God to the test. They tear scriptures out of context and then they hold them to God's head like a gun to try to force him to, um, you know, come through. And I, and I think that this is the case a lot of times for people that are into the, the prosperity, health and wealth doctrine, right? Those people that are, you know, the, the name it and claim it, the blab it and grab it crowd, right? They misuse verses like 3 John verse 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. See, right there, there it is. There's God's word. He wants you to be wealthy and he wants you to be healthy. Never be sick. Or this is a great one. Mark 16, 17 and 18 says, And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them, and they'll lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover. So there you have it. They'll take up serpents. They'll, they'll, if they drink something deadly, it's not going to hurt them. So we got these guys that they're dancing around with rattlesnakes, drinking Clorox, and you know, they say, hey, if you get sick, if you die from a snake bite, or if you die from drinking poison, then the problem is, is you didn't have enough faith. Well, Listen, if you're dancing with snakes and you're drinking Clorox, you know what? You're going to die because you're stupid. Okay? I, I'm, not to put too fine a point on it, but that's the truth. Hey, that's the truth. Verse 7. Jesus said to him, It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Notice that Jesus says, it is written again. Okay? It says, it is written again. You can't just take a verse out of context and make a doctrine out of it, right? We need to compare the Bible with the Bible. The Bible never contradicts itself, and um, we're to look at it and take it as a whole, right? We're not to, to just rip pieces out of it. We need to take the Bible as a whole and let the whole Bible shape and lead and guide us through life. 
We're not to put God to the test to make him prove himself to us because he's already proved himself to us, right? He's proved his love to us at the cross. He's proven himself faithful. If by no other way he's proven himself faithful, hey, you're here today watching this study. He's been faithful to you. He's carried you through. One thing that I always do, it's a habit of mine, uh, when I meet older believers, people that have been walking with the Lord 50, 60, 70 years, I always ask them one question. Has God ever not been faithful to you? And uh, always, without exception, and I ask a lot of older saints this question, but always, without exception, you see this big grin come on their face. And they, and they say with just the, the sweetest tone, no. God has always been faithful and he always will be faithful. He'll never forsake us and he'll never let us down. Our God has nothing to prove. He's proven it to us time and time again. We just have to receive it. We just have to rest in it. We just have to act upon that belief. We should never try to manipulate or to conjure up some situation where we're forcing God to prove himself to us. Verse 8 and 9. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. Personally, I think that this really happened, that it wasn't a vision. I, I believe that somehow Satan takes Jesus and he shows him, literally he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. He probably shows him Times Square. He probably showed him, you know, um, you know, Paris, London, Berlin, San Francisco. He probably showed him Vegas. You know, like somehow Jesus was going to ooh and awe over the lights at night. Like, whoa, are you kidding me? That's what you're offering me? You know, but I guarantee you what he didn't show him is the sin that was going on in those cities. Right. This is probably now the worst temptation that the devil throws at Jesus, because at this time, Jesus is at his very weakest. So the devil, in a sense, pulls out the big guns. He pulls out the, what he's been saving, the best for last, right? And notice here first what happens is the devil this time, he doesn't say, since you're the son of God, right? If you're the son of God. And the reason why he doesn't say this to Jesus is because he's going to ask Jesus to fall down and worship him, which is wildly idolatrous, Right. And it's not a good idea to remind Jesus that, you know, before you wish worship me, don't don't forget you are the son of God. Right. That's how the devil works again. He twists the situation. He he perverts the truth. He's willing to subtract things when it's convenient, add things when it suits him just to get you to succumb to some kind of temptation. And here's the thing. Jesus knows that God has promised the kingdoms of the world to him, right? He knows Psalm, Psalm 2, 6 through 9, which says, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion, and I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. Psalm 22 Verse uh, 27, Jesus knows this. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. They'll turn to you. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. But Jesus, he's also aware of the suffering that's ahead of him. He's aware of uh, Isaiah chapter 53. He's aware of uh, Psalm 22. And now what Satan is doing is he's offering him a shortcut. He's saying, hey, Jesus... There's no need for you to go to the cross, okay? I can give you what you're looking for. You know, I'll give you a shortcut. You don't have to suffer under God's plan. I'll give you what it is that you want. You don't have to go to the cross. All you need to do is just one time, just one time, bow your knee before me and worship me, and I'll give it to you. It's not that hard. It'll save you from a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And again, we need to understand he's attacking Jesus 
at his very weakest, right? I mean, Jesus cried out in the garden in uh, not too terribly long, three years down the road, he's gonna cry out, oh my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Do you think that Jesus wanted to go to the cross and suffer unbelievable amounts of pain? You think he wanted to suffer separation from the Father as he takes our sin, our wickedness upon himself? He asked the Father, if mankind can be saved any other way, boy, let's explore that. Let this cup pass, right? If mankind in any way can be saved, you know what? If we don't have to go to the cross, not that he was afraid, but in his humanity, there was, there was a problem for him, right? He suffered and was tempted in all ways like ourself. It was not a pleasurable thing for him. But you know what we read is that there is no other way. Someone has to pay for the sins. Someone has to be judged because God is righteous and he must judge sin. Somebody has to um, stand in judgment for those sins. And Jesus, he didn't want to have to suffer in his, his humanity. But again, the Bible tells us that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross despising the shame. The purpose of Jesus was coming was to redeem fallen man. He endured the cross for your salvation. That was the reason. He, he suffered and bled for your justification, for your cleansing. He was willing to do that. You're the joy that was set before him. We must never forget that. No matter how long we walk with the Lord, we need that to just always be a beautiful thought and, a, and an awe-inspiring thought that causes us to fall on our knees to worship Him. He knew your salvation could only be won by Him going to the cross. Jesus knew that there was no crown without the cross. He knew that He couldn't be the, the Savior of the world without suffering uh, on the cross, taking our penalty, absorbing the righteous indignation, the wrath of God in our place, absorbing the, the, the wrath of God that our sins deserve, right? The devil offers the same temptation to us today. Make no mistake about it. Hey, listen, you don't have to deny yourself. You don't have to pick up your cross. I mean, there's another way, right? Why do, you, why do you need to go through the pain of denying your flesh, of putting to death that old man? I got a better way. I got a shortcut for you, right? But we need to understand, putting to death the old man, it hurts. And there is no shortcut, okay? Saying no to the old man, crucifying our flesh, um, denying ourselves, living a disciplined life, it's not easy. It's a daily struggle and it requires humility. When we blow it, we need to humble ourselves. You know, honey, I'm sorry. You know, what I said, it was wrong. I was acting like a jerk. Please, would you, could you find it in your heart to forgive me? I'm sorry. You know, I lied to you. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? I've been gossiping about you. I've harbored ill feelings towards you. Hey, would you forgive me? You know, I've listened to gossip and, and I, I've not put a stop to it. Will you please forgive me? I've allowed bitterness to well up in my heart against you. Would you forgive me? We need to be humble. We need to crucify the old man. The devil, he offered Jesus, his, he offered Jesus, take two. The devil, he offers Jesus, right? the kingdoms of the world. But you know what, Jesus? He didn't come to redeem the kingdoms of the world. He came to redeem fallen man. He wants our hearts, right? When we pray, you know, God, would you give us Truckee? Would you give us this city? You know, our prayer is not that God would give us the city, that he would give us that downtown strip that we would have the buildings. No, our prayer is, God, would you save souls? 
Would you change lives in this city? Would you bring lost sinners into the family of God? God, would you just let revival break out in our city? Would you allow us to see your glory in the hearts of mankind, saving people that deserve hell? That's our prayer. God's not interested in the buildings. He's interested in the people. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. 1 John 5, 14. You know what? I'm just foolish enough to believe that God has a plan to save lost people in Truckee. And that plan actually involves Calvary Chapel of Truckee. If we're obedient to him, if we're willing to be broken before him, if we're willing to step out in faith um, in order to be used by him, he's going to use us. Verse 10, Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Now, I see Jesus in my mind right now. He's got the sword of the the, uh, spirit in his hand, the word of God, and he's just plunging it deep into the heart of Satan here. The devil, uh, he's the prince of the power of the air, it says in Ephesians. He's the God of this age, it says in 2 Corinthians. And Jesus says he was the ruler of this world in John. 1 John 5.19 says, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Right? And Jesus knew, Jesus knew if he were to bow down and worship Satan here, that he would become his master. Right? Because the thing that is the passion in your life, that's what becomes your God. You know, if you're worshiping money, then you know it's, that's what's going to rule your life. It's going to rule your every decision. If you're worshiping the weekends, then you're going to endure the struggles at work five days a week. You're going to spend your money on expensive toys just so you can have a couple of you know, nice days a month to just enjoy. Um, but hey, guess what? In the end, it's all meaningless in light of eternity. Everything that we place in our life above God It's waste for me to live for Christ and die as gain. For me to live and you fill in the blank as to to ski, to, to, you know, build my portfolio, whatever the case may be. If that's for you to live as that, then to die as loss, right? How many Christians are ineffective with their walk with the Lord and their witness for the Lord because they allow things to creep in to become the primary passion of their life. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. Either you're going to hate the one and um, love the other, or else you're going to be loyal to the one and despise the other. You know, there's nothing wrong with planning for retirement. There's nothing wrong with having wealth, having a nice home. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the weekends or loving sports, getting out with your your kids, getting them into organized sports. Nothing wrong with that. But when they slowly creep into the place of our life where they become our passion, where they become the priority in our life, where they begin to keep us from church and keep us from fellowshipping with other believers, that's when they become a problem. Don't allow anything to creep into your life that's going to eclipse Jesus and your witness for him. Don't allow anything to gain priority in your life that you begin to live for that you can't walk away from in a moment's notice that you just can't put down. Verse 11, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. And uh, we need to understand here Quoting scripture isn't how we get the victory, right? I mean, you can't look at a young girl and say, you know, I've made a covenant with my eyes that uh, I should not look upon a young woman. You can't just quote Job and just be okay. You know what? Our victory doesn't come from quoting scripture. It comes from being obedient to scripture, to submitting ourselves to the scripture. Also, 
I want you to, to understand this. Jesus endured greater temptation than we'll ever face. The devil, he's not omnipresent, right? He's not every place at one time. He has limited resources. He has a, a limited crew of uh, devil, little devils, demons, uh, running around with him. And so when you and I are attacked, it's not by the devil. It's by some guy that maybe the devil trained, that trained the next guy, that trained the next guy. That tra- I mean, you know what? Uh, we're probably getting a low-ranking demon at best. But Jesus was tempted by the devil himself. And here's the question. When you're tempted, how long do you hold out? An hour or two? A day or two? A week or two? I mean, uh, how long do you hold out? I mean, when we give into temptation, even though, you know, there's a a great deal of um, embarrassment and shame that arises to giving into it, but also there's a, a, a bit of relief. You know, it's over, you know. But Jesus, he never gave in. He, he endured to the end. And the devil just didn't end his temptation right here. In fact, remember Peter, he tried to discourage Jesus from going to the cross. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense for me. For uh, You're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. Right? The devil through the Pharisees, they were always trying to trip him up and trap him in his words in an attempt to discredit him before, for, before people. We need to be aware of the fact that one victory, it never guarantees um, freedom from, from, from temptation. You know, the one thing you have to give to the devil, you have to give him props, at least in this area. He's not a quitter. He's persistent. And you know what? He never compromises. He's after us to get us to fall, to get us to stumble, to get us to walk away from the Lord. He wants to destroy your lives. He wants to destroy those people that you love that are around you. And we can never let our guard down. But we need to be assured too, every time we're successful at overcoming temptation, he's all the more motivated to get us to fall. He's all the more motivated to look for that next opportunity. He doesn't quit. But Jesus, he shows us that we can defeat the devil with the very tools that he used. Again, the power of the Holy Spirit in our life and the word of God. James 4, 7, again, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Last Thursday, we talked about the fall of Adam and Eve there in Genesis chapter 3. And we talked about the tactics of the devil in detail. If you didn't see it, I encourage you, hey, watch that study. You know, because those tactics we saw in Genesis 3, they're the same tactics that the devil's using here to tempt Jesus. The same things that he he does in our lives to get us to to, um, fall, right? It's the lust of the eyes. It's the lust of the flesh. And it's the pride of life. Now, we're going to bring it to an end. Um, I know we're going a little long, but just just a few things that I just want to uh, mention before uh, we end up here. And these are things that I'd like to ask you to think through, pray through. Okay? First, I don't see any place in the Bible where believers are talking to the devil. Okay? He, he can't defeat Jesus, but we're no match for him either. I mean, I think our example needs to come from Jude 9, where it says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring, in, uh, bring against him a riling, reviling accusation. But he said, The Lord rebuke you. Now, for me, I take this to be my example. I think this should be our example as believers. We want to keep... Uh, Jesus between us and the devil. I have no business talking to the devil. You know, when I feel the devil is attacking in my life, attacking in our marriage or attacking in our family, I cry out to the Lord. I say, God, please, would you just, would you rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus? Would you just, um, you know, put a shield around us, Lord, and and not allow him to come against us? I mean, I just want to have Jesus between me and the devil at all times. Secondly, and this is really important, maybe today you're thinking, you know what, I'm doing pretty good actually. I mean, I'm not experiencing any attack. Well, maybe that's because you pose no threat to the devil 
and to his kingdom, right? There's a story of uh, John Wesley a long time ago, right? John Wesley, he's a British guy back in England, and he's riding in his horse and buggy, and he realizes that it had been three days, three whole days since he sensed the devil attacking him. And boy, just that thought, boy, it made him stop. He got out on his knees and he began to pray, Father, if there's something that has come between me and you that I'm not experiencing attack any longer, Lord, would you forgive me? And just as, the, as he's praying this, there's a farmer just down the road. He picks up a rock and he throws it at him and he says, we don't need your kind around here, John Wesley. And John Wesley, he gets up off his knees. He just says, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the attack. And he gets in his buggy and he takes off. And you know what? If you're not experiencing attack, maybe you don't pose a threat here. Finally, if you're not a believer today, I want you to know that Jesus went to the cross for you, right? He values you. He sees you as a treasure. I mean, he longs to have a relationship with you. He longs to have you as his son and daughter. He, he longs to have you let him just love you. You know, he's not asking anything from you. He's not looking for anything from you. You know, he wants to just enter into a relationship with you. If you're not a believer, and you know, you would like to, to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, there's no magic formula. There's, there's no repeat a prayer after me and wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. You know what you do from the sincerity of your heart? You just go to him and just say, God, I confess, I've sinned, I've fallen short, and I, I need a Savior. Would you please forgive me of my sins and come into my life? You know, again, it's no magic formula. It's just from the sincerity of your heart, just asking for forgiveness, asking Him to fill you with your Holy, His Holy Spirit so that you can follow after Him. And again, the promise is that He'll hear that prayer and He'll save you. I just want to encourage you. What's so important that you wouldn't want God's forgiveness? What's so important? How great is your life that you don't need His love in your life? Boy, I just want to encourage you. You know what? If you'll pray, He'll forgive you and He'll make you a new creation and life will change on a dime. You won't be free from attack. You won't be free from hardship. But you know what? You'll have Jesus walking with you every step of the way. Never leave you, never forsake you. Let's pray. Father God, I just, I just thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the power that's in your name. I thank you for the Holy Spirit in our life. Lord, I thank you for the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And God, I do pray for us as a church, Lord, that we wouldn't seek out any shortcuts, that we wouldn't, um, you know, seek to, to avoid the pain of being conformed into your image, of, of dying to ourself, of picking up that cross. Lord, that we wouldn't be lured by the shortcut that this, the enemy would offer us. Lord, I pray that we would be a people that would love you, would walk with you, that we would love mercy, and that we would be humble before you. Lord, that we would humble ourselves to a brother or sister that, that we've wronged, Lord, that we would just, just put to death the old man and walk in the, the power of the Spirit and the newness of life. Lord, and for those out there that maybe have wronged somebody, Lord, I pray for that humility that they would go and, and ask for forgiveness. Lord, I pray, God, that we would be men and women of the Word, men and women willing to be broken over the, the lost in this city, men and women willing to fast and pray, men and women of the word, men and women that are willing to step out in faith to be used by you, to see you glorified, to see you exalted. Lord, help us be obedient to your word. Father, I pray for anybody out there that doesn't know you. I pray, God, that you would just be moving on their hearts even right now, that they would just confess their sins, 
and they would come into that right relationship with you, that you would make them that new creation and that you would give them times of refreshing as their sins have been blotted out, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you. Fill us with your spirit. Use us for your glory. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, Calvary Chapel Truckee, I love you. We're praying for you. Can't wait for um, this COVID to lift so we can meet together. Happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. God bless you. A special day. Hey, uh, guys, call your moms, okay? If they're away, if they're not nearby, call them and just tell them you love them. Thank, thank them for, God, their love for you and pray for them. Ask them if you can pray for your mom. They'll, they'll love it, okay? God bless you all. Um, if you gave your heart to the Lord, you're a new believer, get a hold of us at the office. Let's talk. Let us get a Bible into your hands, okay? God bless. We'll see you.